Okay. Here we go, here we go. Let's make sure nothing in the background is sucking up all my bandwidth. Let's close that. Great. Okay, folks, welcome. Today, oh, I should close that. Here we go. Today, we are starting Plato's Republic. My goodness. A controversial book, a great book, probably one of the greatest, I, I would argue, in this class, you know, it probably sounds like a bit of ego, but of all the books I picked are greatest books. But this one is near the top of greatest books ever written, um, in any category, perhaps. Uh, it's an excellent book. Uh, it's widely regarded and widely maligned. People love to argue about this book. Um, that's one reason we're going deep into it. Uh, probably the only controversy here for if an external person is watching, I did not pick Aristotle. I picked Plato. Uh, I will defend my choice as we go along, but for now, just assume that I, you know, the professor must prefer this over Aristotle. Short answer, yes. I love Aristotle, but you would have no Aristotle without Plato. So, <laughs> okay. So let's see, today, where's my slides? But yes, we are going to do the Introduction to Republic. This is, as I said in the stream title, this is part one of five. We will be doing two and a half weeks of the Republic. We're going to work our way through. Um, if you've never read it, it's very conversational. I do think we'll get to most of it. Now today, I do not, we're not going to hit the entire introduction written by the, I don't think it was written by the translator, it was written by somebody else. I'm looking at the back of my book here. Uh, this is our, the copy we're using is Penguin Classics, and it was translated by uh, Desmond Lee. But the introduction is by someone named Melissa Lane. So slightly different people are uh, doing the translation and the introduction. But still, it has a pretty solid area introduction. Uh, we'll do part of it. I'm not going to do the whole thing just because I don't think we have the time today. Uh, but we'll see how far we get. I did read it all again, so we should be fine if we are forced to get there. Uh, I want to point out, too, if anybody who's... This is the second book we've done. Sometimes introductions can feel like spoilers. Uh, when I was a student, I kind of didn't like introductions. Um, mostly because I felt like they were forcing my mind down a certain track. And I just liked dealing with primary sources on my own. Um, it did help by the time I had that opinion. I'd read several tens or hundreds of them. Uh, that might not be y'all's problem yet. But it can feel sometimes like spoilers, but really the reason I like to do books with good introductions is because you get the setting and kind of the conventional arguments around the book. And it's really good for making contextual historical arguments and analysis. Because most people, you're not required to know that to be in this class, right? So you might not know anything about Plato, ancient Greece, you know, the, the, their ways of thought, the Greek language. So this is the chance to get a little bit of that introduction. And this translator, this translator and this introduction writer both do a very good job of, and that's one of the goals of Penguin Classics, is to help non-specialists deal with ancient books. And that's why I like to use them. So if you were curious, that's why I've selected these. All right. So okay, my little spiel, so let's get going. So if you've got your book in front of you, we're just going to jump right in. Let me get mine too. Okay, introduction, this is fun. So right away we get a guy you've probably never heard of. Um, and I'm gonna read the first line here, right? Exiled from his native Austria during the Second World War, philosopher Karl Popper sought to explain how Western society had arrived at the totalitarian ideas of fascism and communism. He came to believe the root of this malign development behind the usual spec specs. So Nietzsche, Hegel, and Marx, lay Plato's Republic, oh man. So 1945, Hegel, Popper basically blames the Republic for World War II, all 20th century totalitarianism. And for a lot of people who've never read the Republic seriously, this is how people get opinions of the Republic. Remember I said it was malign? So people can look at the Republic and go like, oh my god, it's so horrible, oh, what evil it teaches. And who's Karl Popper, by the way, if you don't know him? He's an Austrian, they say philosopher, but he's... A, I think it's fair actually to call him a philosopher, but he's an Austrian economics, aka he's a libertarian, right? And if we we didn't really talk about libertarians yet, but libertarians believe uh, fundamentally all state is evil, and either minimal state or no state is best. And so this this book literally advocates for a state, so it's evil. Now specifically, Karl Popper does blame the entire totalitarian 20th century on this one book uh that's a bit of a uh yeah as the tr as our introduction writer points out it's a bit of a stretch 
Now, why doesn't he like it? He obviously has an argument, right? And Karl Popper was a very rational guy, so what are his arguments? He basically argues something like, Plato's system had no institutional checks and balances. And if you've never read it, he already kind of hints at what it is. Uh, having it advocated for rule of philosopher kings and queens without institutional checks basically leads to totalitarianism. And uh, he basically takes the liberal axiom of power corrupts. And if you've never heard, and this is why I love Penguin Classics 2, they have a nice set of footnotes here. Where's my... Yeah. Oh, yeah, they put them in the front. Yeah, and this, oh, by the way, this book, the famous book he wrote, is called Open Society and Its Enemies. And the chapter it's from, the, actually the volume is called The Spell of Plato. And then this is quoting Lord Acton, who is a f liberal philosopher from England, obviously, because he's the Lord, who said power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. So it's a very, like, liberal idea that, like, oh, you can never have power because it will corrupt you, so we gotta, you know, abolish the government or make it weak. Um, now, interestingly enough, as our translator points out, the Republic agrees with Karl Popper that power corrupts. Uh, and as, the, as our Melissa here uh, points out, um, the Republic does address danger of power will corrupt, yet at its core is related to the a desire for power corrupts, and more than that, destroys. And this is a very interesting ethical point. It's not that power itself corrupts. The desire to be powerful corrupts and destroys the soul. Uh, again, this is kind of like another famous quote uh, that always gets misquoted, just like the Republic is, right? The, 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 the misquote is, money is the root of all evil. But that is not the quote, right? The quote is, the love of money is the root of all evil. The Platonic Popperian version would be, the love of power is the root of totalitarianism, right? It's not that power makes totalitarianism, it's the love or the desire for it. And as uh, the person here points out, it destroys people who, in never-ending pursuit of power, undermine their psychological health. And it destroys politics as rulers desiring power for self-gratification undermine political unity. And so, point, and at the same time, though, Republic points this out. First, someone has to use power. Uh, and one reason libertarians don't like Plato, right? Um, Plato is a realist in the way that he goes, one must wield power. We have to, have, every society needs someone to wield power, right? There has to be an army that's defending you. There has to be some kind of police force, even if we don't call it police, right? There's some kind of law enforcement of some kind. S one, someone has to wield it. So, if we, if we kind of admit that someone needs to wield it, we need to find someone to wield it. As he says, uh, as Melissa says, if all but very few rare individuals are able to achieve stability and order in their souls, which gives happiness, and their policies, which gives unity. So there's rare individuals with stable enough souls that can handle power without desiring it and without being corrupted by it. So this is kind of Plato's journey, is to figure out who these people are and how we can make them lead. All right. And like I said, uh, it's these people can give happiness because they are happy, and they can create unity in politics because they're not dividing by being, like, power-grubbing, right? They're serving kind of the good of society and the good of themselves instead of just extracting. So this is kind of the goal of Plato in his Republic. And there's even a higher goal than that, but oh, I don't want to spoil it too much, and I'll let the uh, introduction writer speak for herself before I contradict her. Okay, now how does Plato do this? Well, this is where we get the name of the book, right? Plato makes a new city, and it's ruled by philosophers, and it checks the control and desire for power in the subjects. That's the fast version. And what makes the, the philosophers good? Uh, well, they are not only reluctant rulers, they're capable of gaining knowledge of what is good. Again, and this is important. And I'm pointing out here, too, we're, we're back to Confucius, where we're making the assumption there is a good, an objective good, and reluctant rulers who are these people of stable souls can gain knowledge of the good and then rule better. 
So, and this, this book is and was Transformational Politics, Ethics, Knowledge, and the author says psychology. Um, in the ancient world, psychology wasn't separate from philosophy. It's only in the modern age where these four get separated. It's a very strange, and I'm saying this from a historical perspective, that we would separate any of these. Because for Plato, to say any of these were separate would be stupid. Right? Like, you can't talk about psychology without talking about knowledge, without talking about politics, without talking about ethics. They're all the same thing. Now, if this sounds familiar, remember, Confucius had that kind of similar opinion of, right, that an ethical father is an ethical ruler is an ethical husband, right? Like, ethics and psychology and how we know things are all tied together. But the Greeks, it's even a stronger correlation. Oh, man. My next page is messed up. But I'll leave this here for now. Uh... Any questions while I fix my next slide? I'll give us 30 seconds. I didn't do the animations right, so I'm going to fix those real quick. And this is only the first two pages of the intro, right? It's pretty chill. But if you, if you read it, it should be clear. But this is what we're kind of art, the kind of fight that Plato has to go against in the modern age. Uh, much better. not see any questions yet. All right. And I get a fun excuse to use some cool images. Uh, why not take it? All right, so let's jump on in. So Plato's keep going on the introduction. Uh, what's the setting here? And again, remember I said this is the best part of the intro is we can actually get some of this setting. So the politics of Plato's world. Um, so Plato wrote, he was the Thymian, which is a city in Greece, which is the current capital, Athens. Uh, but during his life, some big things happened. Firstly, he wrote Republic, we think, in 375. But before that, in BC, in 404 BC, there was a defeat of Athens to Sparta. Athens was a, a democracy that basically conquered a vast majority of the Greek world and defeated the Persians. It mentions here. That's why I have a 300 picture of Sparta, which you're like, what about, wait, why Sparta? Well, it was an alliance between Athens and Sparta, which even this author doesn't actually mention, uh, to beat the biggest empire in their world. They beat the Persians and held them back, but then they became tyrants and conquered uh, their home near abroad, and uh, finally Sparta defeated Athens, which kind of destroyed their worldview, and then there was an oligarchic coup in Athens, which ruled for a while and obviously was supported by Sparta, and then there was a counter-revolution where democracy was reformed, and during that they killed Socrates. Now we'll get into Socrates next slide, but Socrates was Plato's teacher. Socrates is also the birth and the synthesis of this whole line of philosophy, which is called Platonism or Neoplatonism. And Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle are all in this school. Uh, we'll talk about why it's very influential later, but uh, it, it basically dominated the Greek and Roman world for a thousand years, would be fair. From, from Plato to St. Augustine, basically Platonism dominated. And then for another thousand years, Platonism, actually more like 1500, Platonism was even dominant in uh, Christianity through guys like St. Augustine. And I know you can say St. Augustine, but I am American, so I can willfully choose to mispronounce things. Although I do know the other uh, pronunciation exists. Now the conclusion here <coughs> that Plato makes, he's part of all these events, by the way. Two of his brothers were some of the uh, oligarchs. His teacher was killed by democracy. He sees the weakness of both of these systems. And there's problems in both. Let me give you some examples. Um, and if you've never studied Greek democracy, now's a great time. So this is on uh, Roman numeral 11 and 12. So uh, democracy in ancient Athens was different from democracy today. It accorded all citizens the opportunity for equal political participation. Most offices were assigned by lot, which is the old version of like putting a name in a hat. Key decisions were made by the assembly, where every citizen had a right to speak, and without any professional judges or prosecutors. It was up to ordinary citizens to bring indictments and decide trials by juries. Political equality brought rivalry for power in its train, as people competed for influence. It brought tension between the few rich and the many poor. 
And demos is Greek, by the way, for people. And kratia comes from kratein, which is ru rule or power. And then it also always ends up meaning rule by the common people because they have more people and they're ideologically dominant and then they basically cause tension with the elites. And, un and this is here ironically or unironically, depending on your perspective. Uh, democracy can many, many, many times end up in a tyrannical empire that dominates its subjects. I'm sure this would shock everybody here. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. But generally speaking, in, from the ancient world till the 19th century or the 18th century, dem democracy was seen as tyrann like it was tyrannical inside, right? Basically, the uh, the common people would tyrannize everybody else, mostly the people who had stuff, and then they would tyrannize every other neighbor. Even though there's some upsides, right? They obviously have ability to get imperial power. That was kind of strength of democracy, and they mentioned the Greeks were also very proud of it. Now, what's the alternative? Uh, the alternative, as the book mentions, is oligarchy, which means rule by a few, in which privileges and citizenship of political decision-making was restricted to a small elite group, but was the solution? No. <laughs> right? It basically became a civil war. So the oligarchs did everything they could to defend themselves from the people. So I just explained democracy. Uh, and Plato's critique, obviously was what I just said, right? The fact that it's uh, it's tyrannous, it's, you know, it's tyrannical and like lowest common denominator. And then oligarchy has its same kind of problems, which was it basically is a civil war where the rich are trying to protect their stuff and let's be honest, extract the poor. So neither of these worked and Plato lived long enough to see both of them fail. So okay, what's the solution? Well, there's something, and this is why we have a cool Spartan picture, there's something in Sparta that may that many people in their time thought might be a solution. Um, what did Sparta do? Well, th there was oligarchs in Sparta, but it was longer lasting and ingrained in their way of life. And there was unity in the ruling class, maintained through strict discipline, including common meals, demanding military training, and what was come to be called quote unquote Spartan as an adjective. And Spartan means materially austere, which means you spend as little as possible on your material well-being. And it's still an adjective in English. That's how important this word was. So Spartans survived such a long time because they were not self-interested materially. They were group-interested as, you know, working together. And, and it says in here, though, obviously the Republic adapts Spartan life to Greece. And we'll get into how it does that, right? If you have any questions, now is the time. Uh, did I see a popped-up question? I swear I did. Nope, that's another channel. I'll give you 30 seconds for questions about this, but it should be pretty easy. If you read, I mean. But any setting questions that I can elaborate. And if you're curious, yes, I think that is Leonidas from the movie. If you haven't seen 300, what are you doing? It's probably one of the best movies in the last 20 years. Top five. And three of the other ones are probably Lord of the Rings. <laughs> All right, I don't see any questions, so let's keep going. Uh, and this is an Athenian, by the way. I think it's from probably Rome Total War. That'd be my guess. Probably the new one. Because it's pretty advanced looking pretty decent graphics. That is not, they didn't just take a picture of them. You can't, right? They're all dead. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, writing a constitution. So that's the subsection. Now, what's the kind of spoiler here? Well, the name of this group, book in Greek is Politia, which means constitution, but it happens to be rendered in English as the Republic. Basically, if you don't know, uh, Res Publica is Latin. And so the Latin name for this book is The Republic, and we get it from Latin, so we call it The Republic. That is not actually its name in Greece, but uh, most of our Greek knowledge we got secondhand for about 1,500 years. And by secondhand, I mean it would go Latin, English, and actually that's a lie. Uh, why do I say it's a lie? Because until the 19th century, ni uh, 1900s, the 20th century, anybody who was college educated could speak Latin. We are, we're currently the third or fourth, I guess y'all are the fourth generation of college goers that couldn't speak Latin as a native speaker. So, uh, welcome to 
we can't read Latin. It's too bad. So, okay, uh, writing a constitution. So the goal of this book was Plato's trying to make a solution. And specifically, he is a patriot uh, in his way, make a solution for Athens. So he figured out pretty early on that unity of the ruling class is critical to success. Uh, no order can survive disunity of its ruling class. And it doesn't really matter who the ruling class is. There's this weird... Well, it's not weird. I'll call it a... There's a communist and a, and a kind of revolutionary democratic idea. And, spoiler, we live in a country that was founded as a revolutionary-ish republic. Um, actually, though, the United States is based much more on Sparta and, you know, Plato than it was on uh, Locke. But we'll get into that later. But any ruling class has to have unity to be successful. If they're fighting each other and outsiders and everybody else, it inevitably must collapse. All right. Now, self the, another goal of this book, obviously, is the self-reflection for their own people. And he does point out, obviously, here, one thing that made Sparta successful is their own unity. How did they get it? Well, social interaction and formation of their citizens. So how people interact with each other and how citizens were educated. We'll get into education, but it's a huge pillar healer. And also, because he's an ancient Greek, there's these two inseparable ideas that are Athenian ideas, which he did not take out of government. And he would argue would have been a critique of Sparta, because Sparta did not care about these things. But government, a, a good government, should make people happy and virtuous, not just happy. So, in an ancient Greek and specifically Platonic sense, um, you need to have both of these to be a good government. So, it makes people happy and virtuous. And we'll get into what happy means in a Greek sense in a second. Now, uh, part of this too, uh, it can, to a modern ear, this can almost sound weird, but let me explain. Writing a constitution for a soul. So, this is not only a constitution for a government, but again, if we're making virtuous people, you have to, you have, to have a process by which to make them. Uh, again, right, we talked about Confucius, that the system starts with how to make filial virtuous people, and Plato is in a similar kind of state. Um, basically, to have a virtuous constitution and a virtuous state, you have to start with people, which starts with people's souls, which then means you require psychological unity and the harmony of each citizen not only with each other, but within themselves. So if the citizenry don't have internal harmony, if one's soul isn't harmonious, how can you be harmonious with other people? Right? You can't even do it in yourself. How are you going to do it external for yourself? So, in a way, this is, a very, this is similar to the Confucian character argument, right? It's this idea that one must have psychological harmony and unity. Otherwise, how can you do that outside yourself, right? If you can't I'll give you a, a kind of almost oversimplification, but I, th I think it's uh, demonstrative. Think about this, right? Like, imagine an obese person giving another person health and workout advice. One could argue that person doesn't have a unity and harmony of their own health. How can you lecture me, right? And that's a fair, that's a fair, just, balanced critique. And the same thing is true with everything else, right? Um, especially if we're talking about the kind of constitution. So, for Plato, he wouldn't say his system's unjust uh, or even, you know, wrong. He would say, well, actually, I, self, my system does have self-government, but it's self-government of your own soul that matters. And if everyone could do that, that self-government, then truly the system would be just and good, even if you don't get a vote. That would be kind of his answer. He's like, because he lives in a time when voting literally killed his uh, mentor, and we'll talk about how it killed him in a second. No, oh, that is fine. Good. Any questions about this so far? I think this one's pretty easy too. Again, you don't have to agree, but it doesn't make sense. That's what we're asking.
All right, not seeing any questions, we will continue. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, oh, man, I checked that. I wasn't supposed to do that. Hold on, I really don't want it all to show up. That always bugs the crap out of me. Okay, oh, I see. Only the first one. Yeah. I just made it these mornings, so some of the slides were not popping up as much as I liked. I'm going to fix it in real time, because that bugs me so much. And it's really information overload. Every time I've done it, it's a mistake. People try to read the whole thing and don't pay attention. Okay, here we go. Even if you read the book, this should still be something we go over. All right, so let's do it. Uh, Plato's Republic, let's go. Ooh. Okay, so let's keep going with this. We're going to get into who Socrates is a little bit. Now, if you, you haven't read the book yet, probably, so you don't understand. But first, we got to know Socrates. So at the basic level, he's the main character of our book, and this is a 50-year flashback. Um, so, just a quick, the book mentions this too, but basically, Socrates, like Confucius and Jesus, wrote nothing. Instead, his followers wrote. Um, Plato is the em most eminent follower of Socrates, but there were others. Um, Xenophon is a big one, he was a soldier, so people don't tend to like him. Uh, and in this dialogue, two of the characters are actually Plato's brothers. So, like, people around Plato, including Plato, we're following Socrates around. Now, interestingly enough, Plato never writes as Plato. He only ever writes as Socrates. Talk about being a loyal follower. So there's there's some controversy, and the book mentions, like, we don't actually know how reliable it is. Um, I'm going to be honest. Oral history is surprisingly reliable. Um, there's been a lot of research in the field of history. Oral history, in a lot of ways, is even more reliable than written history. Why? Think about it this way. If we're sitting around a campfire, and we're a bunch of small villages all together, and I'm telling a story, and we were all there, right? 90, let's say half of us were there. If I start telling a fake story, do you know what happens? The other people at the fire make fun of me, <laughs> right? Like, you get automatically checked by the other people around. It's actually really hard to, like... Oral histories get kind of fact-checked by everybody, so they're actually decently reliable, especially if it's an event that everybody witnessed. So even though Socrates, Socrates to Plato can technically be thought of as like a re-reporting or oral history, most people within memory of Plato writing encountered Socrates. So if he had plagiarized, he wouldn't have been as successful as he was, or if he would have, let's say, misrepresented him. So a lot of the time, as far as we know, Plato is an elaboration of Socrates' ideas, but not a, like, deviation. So something interesting to keep in mind. Some people really poo-poo on this type of transmission. I don't think it's as unreliable as moderns like to think. Now, what, what, is, what is some kind of big theme here? In general, we see in Socrates' work, but especially in the Republic, he argued against evasion of morals for bodily pleasure and gain. So he basically argues against materialism and just pure profit. Now, we get his background in here, in this book, a little bit, but Socrates is famous for never having really taken eminent positions. He served his duty, he did what he must for his city. He served in the military, he served in the government, he served on ju judges, but that's it. He also famously never, ever took pay for his work. Now, when we get to sophists, and our translator keeps this bit out, which I don't know why she did that, or the, the introduction writer, but it's important to note, our translator, I think, in fact, does mention it when we get into the meat of it. Socrates never took pay for his teaching. He is famous for walking around Greece just asking questions and drawing a crowd, and it's why they killed him, actually. But, uh, and one reason he was also killed is uh, there's something called the Oracle at Delphi, which was a famous oracle in the ancient world. It was a woman, or normally a girl, in a cave, and she spoke for the god Delphi, and one of Socrates' friends went to the Delph Delphi Oracle and asked, who is the wisest man in all of Greece? And she said, your friend Socrates is. And Socrates didn't believe it. So he spent like 30 years going around Greece asking allegedly smart people questions to prove he wasn't the smartest. And basically what he did is prove everybody was dumb. And that so offended the democracy of Athens, they killed him for asking good questions. <laughs> Now, why do I mention the not getting paid bit? Well, he competed against sophists. Now, to quote the book, uh, she's not wrong. Uh, incomplete might be fair, but let me give you this here. This is on 18. 
Plato and the other students of Socrates, there was a world of difference. They, uh, oh wait, where did I put this? Oh yeah, it goes, it, so um, here we go. This is a world with, without public or higher education. Remember, saying that can stop a sophist is kind of silly. Where memorizing Homer and Hassad was a standard sign of cultivation. But in Democratic Athens, the ability to speak well in public was central. So, there became a school of rhetoric called sophists. They offered instruction to ambitious sons of the rich man who could afford to pay them. So you always had to pay a sophist to get training. At the same time, so what I'm doing right now, sophists would hate. People can watch this free online. They would hate that. So they made into question the validity of the city's law and customs by contrasting them with norms of nature. And uh, that's it. They don't really give you much more than that. But so basically, sophists, their only principle was winning an argument and power. If they could convince a majority of people to do something, it was righteous. And if you could use your rhetoric to get an evil thing done, it's not evil because you were able to do it. They're pure power and material gain people. Sophists were such disingenuous arguers that in philosophy now, 2,500 years later, being a sophist is an insult. So our, trans, our uh, introduction writer really softballs sophists, but we'll see more of them in our book. So for now, just keep that in your memory box, that sophists are basically for-profit, they're almost like lawyers. They're for-profit people who will argue for anything and teach you to argue as long as they get paid. So all they really care about is material gain and victory. They don't care about morals. They don't even think morals exist. All right, now we get to Socrates' death, and specifically, sophists and citizens taught by sophists are the ones who killed Socrates because he taught for free, and he argued against them, and proved them wrong, ethically and morally and consistently. So because of that, they basically accused him of going against the gods and being an atheist, and I'll point out, our introduction writer skipped that whole part. And they're like, Professor, how do you know that? It's because I've read Apologies. Which is the transcription of his death and his trial, and his pre and post, like pre imprisonment. Um, they just basically keep moving the goalpost to kill him. And there is a hugely complex uh, trial. It's great, it's super fun. I wish I had a little more time to talk about it. But um, they basically just shift the goalpost so they can kill him. And he, knowing they're going to kill him, turns the trial into like an exposition where he condemns the Athenians. He basically says, "You, I am a good man, and you, whatever you do to me can't change it. Oh, he ca and he calls them out for their moral failings, and then they, they kill him anyway. It's amazing. And by amazing, I mean it's horrifying, but it demonstrates the complete moral emptiness of sophists. I get the feeling the kind of introduction writer is a little bit sympathetic. So he's condemned to death, and he takes it like a man and dies. Now, what were his arguments? If we're going to, and the, the reason we're going to talk about these is they'll come up. I think this would probably be the end. Let's see. Yeah, I don't have to spoil that much of the story. I'm so freaking happy. <clears throat> yeah, we'll see how far we get. All right. Here we go. Okay, so what are some of his arguments? Well, there's a couple Greek concepts here that we really need to know. So the first one is techna, and uh, our tr introduction does talk about this. So this is on uh, Roman numeral 19, under Socrates' arguments. So techna, or techne, as you're supposed to pronounce it. This is skill knowledge, which uh, it mentions Socrates came from a, a sculptor's father. So it's this idea that there's a skill knowledge that everyone can have in their own field. Um, and again, a thing our translator will point out later, but our introduction writer does not. Techna is the single skill anyone could have and the idea that the skill you have is directly tied to your morality. Techna is this idea of being very good at a thing and being moral at a thing. It's the same difference. This is a, Imagine your technical skill is tied to your morals and we'll get to it later but uh, Plato, Socrates actually thought you couldn't be good at a thing if you were not also moral. So it's, it's a very strong argument here. Now, as they point out, dem dem Democrats and uh, Sophists hate this because you're saying that, that they love to assert there is no techna of politics or of living well as an individual. So no mat there were matters in democracy deferred to no experts. All men were treated equally. So Tecna asserts basically an inequality in man. Everybody has a different skill, so we are not the same, right? Equality just is equal, which means the same. Everyone has a different skill, thus not the same. But those differences are good and moral, 
in this system. Now, it, that is not democratic, but is it just? We'll get into it. Uh, Socrates would say yes. But Democrats do not believe in techna. They didn't like it. Especially for politics. And essentially, this spoils it, right? Socrates will make this argument for trades and philosophy and for politics. Uh, another theory here, we talked about this earlier, but eudaimonia. This is a good word to learn. Um, this is something like living well. Or well-being might be a better translation. It also gets translated as happiness, but it doesn't really mean what we mean in English when we say happiness. It means more like a sense of overall flourishing and well-being. And then the question becomes, how does one gain eudaimonia, right? This is not pleasure or sensuality. That is not what it is. But the way you get here is arete, which is virtue and the cultivation of the four virtues. Now, the four virtues might sound familiar. Here we are. Um, these are on the bottom of uh, 19 in the Roman numerals. The four leading cardinal virtues, and the reason he calls them cardinal, uh, they get adapted to um, Christianity later. Uh, we'll talk about that too. He is, they're broadly ethical, they're composed of wisdom, courage, self-discipline, and justice. And while others are being included, um, oh, I gotta have them here. Along with this, Plato and Socrates agreed, you could not possess any one of these alone. They all hold each other up. You must possess all of them. There's a unity of the virtues. And there's, there's a certain techna to having all the knowledge to live well. So th this is kind of his claim, and people don't always like it. And uh, all of these will get into the definitions, because this whole book is about the definition. Justice is something not just like legal remedies, but it's also something about broadly what is right, um, what is justly owed or justly expected. Also something like psychic harmony and your place in the universe. This is a very broad term, justice. And the whole book is actually about justice, so we'll get into that. Um, but any questions about Socrates the man? I'm skipping over so much of his trial and his death and his life, but um, I want to mention enough so it will get more of his character as we read the book. But any questions about this? Looks like we might get one more slide while we're at it. Let's see. I see. <laughs> Great. Somebody points out they're here for free. Welcome. I'm here for free person. I'm glad you could join us. Always feel free to watch the replays for free, too. And they'll be on YouTube as well. All right, I do not see any questions. Fantastic. So let's keep going. I think we can get one more slide done. I apologize for the gardening, but that is, as the Japanese say, shigata ga arimasen. <laughs> There's nothing I can do about it, no matter how hard I try. Being trapped at home. But, you know, that's life. Man, I'm getting a spider blitz today. My goodness. Okay, let's do one more slow. Ooh, whoa, that was fun. Gardener shooting stuff in my window. I think it's getting personal. Okay. <laughs> All right, let's go a little bit more. Um, I don't like this part from now on. We're going to do a little bit of it, but uh, we get... Uh, I'll call them book spoilers, but we get kind of the introduction writer's opinion. Now, I've already kind of pointed out, I don't think the introduction writer... They're a little too modern in the way that they ignore a bunch of the interesting trends. And then... Uh, and they try to modernize the book a little too much. And then they, they spoil it with their own opinion. So we're going to talk about this barely. Um, but kind of how the book gets started is what we're going to talk about. And it starts with something called Thrasymachus' Challenge. Now, I'm sure Thrasymachus is not how you say this correctly in Greek. But just like how I suck at Chinese names, although I think I suck more at Greek than Chinese, which is interesting. I have no idea how to correctly say Thrasymachus. So I'm going to triple down on saying it like I'm from the South. So we're just going to call him Thrasymachus. So Thrasymachus' challenge. Uh, this is great. Thrasymachus is actually a sophist. In their little... They basically have a little discussion circle that's a, a kind of ad hoc discussion that starts out with just talking about Socrates and an old man are talking and then Thrasymachus gets angry that they kind of talk about what's justice and he jumps in and says this... Justice is simply the interest of the stronger party. So there's a, in book one, we'll read for next week, there's a huge challenge that just, justice is the strong who control cities, and then whatever they say morality and law is, is what it is. 
Now, if this sounds like a modern argument, it is. And more correctly, modern arguments are just exactly the same as classic arguments. It doesn't change. People just think they're super cool and edgy and original, but really they're just doing Thrasymachus' challenge, right? So Thrasymachus asserts that justice is just what benefits the stronger. And we'll get into how it goes. But this is the foundation of the book. And then Thrasymachus is somewhat defeated. And then two other people join the argument. They're called uh, Glaucon and Adamantius. They reformulate his attack under something called the Ring of Gyges, which, again, we're going to go into. Um, may or may not be the basis of Lord of the Rings. But basically, the question is something, we'll do the short version of, if one person was given unlimited power, would anybody not use it? And it's literally a ring of invisibility that gives you power. Sounds like Lord of the Rings, right? So again, uh, there's nothing new under the sun, which is wonderful. And the question they ask Socrates is prove that someone could find a ring of power and not use it for evil. And they're like, so a person who is just free of consequences, they don't believe him. They basically assert that anyone who is given unlimited power would be a tyrant. And specifically, any Democrat who found it, right? Anybody in a democratic society who pretends to live by these democratic virtues, as soon as they were given the ability to be a tyrant, they would be a tyrant. And this is the whole point of this book, is Socrates proving that a one just man could exist. He doesn't have to make a whole just society. He doesn't even have to make, you know, a just world. It's just, could, one, could a system exist where one just man exists? And The Republic is a rare book where Socrates leads the inquiry himself. Almost every other book we have of Socrates that Plato writes, Socrates just asks really good questions. And then somehow, if this one person can exist free of consequences that couldn't use the ring and be a tyrant, it's something like, what, benefits the, what benefit is there to the soul by being just or by having justice? Because this is the argument he fundamentally has to make. How is being just good for the soul free of any material consequences? Again, this is, sounds a little bit like uh, Confucius, right? That being good is good for good's sake, and then being good for good's sake will have positive benefits. And finally, it's an attempt, this whole book is an attempt to convince Democrats that the core of the system, which the book mentions killed a tyrant, has the seeds for tyranny in itself. And it's not enough. So basically, that, that there's the basic argument that Thrasymachus and Glaucon make that a democratic system can't make a man just enough that would resist this ring of power. So part of the argument of the book then becomes it's an attempt to convince Democrats that their system is flawed. And again, in Plato and Socrates' time, they have proof that democracy tyrannizes people. So it's not just in this sense, right? A Democrat raised in democracy can't resist this ring of power. And uh, we'll get into that argument as we go. Um, but we're out of time. So any questions before we go? We've got about two minutes, so I'll give it 30 seconds for questions. Um, but if there is none, we'll uh, start up next time. Any questions? see someone typing well I'll give him a couple seconds I made a nice I got all the pictures for this so I'm gonna show you my nice conclusion picture this is the temple of Artemis by the way okay they somebody asked a good historical question how does the Peloponnesian War fit into all of this it's mentioned a few times in the intro well the Peloponnesian War is the war between the Athenians and the Spartans and it fits in in the way that it kind of demonstrates, the Peloponnesian War demonstrated the deficiencies of democracy. Basically, the Athenians lost. And in history, you could say, democracies are very, in republics, are very good at fighting. But they're, they tend to become tyrannical when they conquer others. And in the end, Athens lost because they were, strictly speaking, tyrants in their empire. Right. So in their city, they had democracy. And everywhere else they conquered, they ruled like a tyranny. Literally, one Athenian would be sent there and rule like a king. 
right? So it's inconsistent morality, and kind of that inconsistent morality destroyed their whole system of government and life. That's how it fits in, basically. So, in a, you know, a democratic system, which they thought was, the Athenians thought was most moral, lost to an oligarchic system. But the moral argument is something like, because they were inconsistent, they lost. Right? Had they treated their, you know, colonies more justly, perhaps they would have won. That's, that's kind of the implication that's often made. Our introduction writer does not, in fact, make that link. That is my link, not theirs. And I've read it in a couple other sources as well. Um, but it, that requires a stronger kind of moral sense that I think our introduction writer does not, in fact, have. That argument's almost Augustinian. Or Roman. Uh, one more question. I see someone typing. Uh, I will answer the other question in the chat because we're technically out of time. Um, but thank you everybody for watching. If you're in the class, I'll send us all out in the Discord for the random people watching or people who watch later. Thank you so much. I hope you had a good time. Um, yeah, have a great day. I'll see you all next Tuesday if you're curious.